Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night. Since we have a global audience, I'm not sure what to say, but so therefore, greetings to all of you and welcome to the 38th talk of the Rail Enthusiast Society. Today's topic is perhaps not the kind that rail enth enthusiasts normally uh, indulge in, global economics and geopolitics of railway standards and motive power. But it is something that is perhaps as important to the railways or any other enterprise as anything else. Uh, the speaker today is Onomitra Ghatak. Uh, although he resides in Canada and works from there, his heart still remains with the Indian railways. I've never met him. In fact, for the first time, I saw him on screen and I know I know what he looks like. But um, uh, from his posting that come on, on our website and on our um, uh, WhatsApp site of the Rail Enthusiast Society, uh, you can appreciate the kind of deep knowledge that he has of the Indian Railways and the love he has for the Indian Railways. During his uh, stay in Toronto, Canada, where he is a entrepreneur and business strategy consultant in financial asset management, Therefore, this subject appears to be right down his line. He has traveled a lot for work and for leisure over Asia, Europe, and North America, and has studied their trains. Therefore, I feel he's perfectly suited for the topic that we have today. So I will not keep you between me and uh, Onomitra. Over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. I think... I may be the most overrated rail fan of all times, but uh, it's it's always good to have an audience that's uh, a lot more knowledgeable as well. And uh, probably a lot of things that I will share would resonate with this audience. Um, what I would like to put a disclaimer on as I start is that all the information I would share today are available on public domain. So anyone who has a bit of curiosity can go on Google and look under the hood if there's more to be shared. Um, sorry. Uh, can you see my screen? Just wanted to make sure that you yeah. can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. So um, about two weeks ago when uh, Mr. Singh asked me to make a presentation, I picked this topic. And uh, in a hindsight, it's a lot of things to, to talk about and which we had to squeeze into a an hour long presentation. So I would probably seem to jump from topic to topic at times. I'll probably talk about things uh, or information at different levels, some very synthesized, some at a very weed level. But uh, if there are any, any issues with the coherence or if we do not connect the dots, please stop me and ask me questions. I'm not a subject matter expert on railways. However, if there are other things that I have to dig out and respond offline, Maybe after the meeting, I can do that too. So um, the way this conversation is structured is, is this. We'll have a bit of uh, background discussion as why we are having this conversation. Then we will go a little bit uh, on an exploration trip on North American railroads. Then we'll talk a bit about Europe, then China and Japan. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see someone from down under, but uh, unfortunately, I didn't put together um, a single slide out there to talk about Australia. Uh, next time, I'll try to do a better job. And then we'll talk uh, about a much discussed topic, which are available all over the social and global media about the Chinese influence in geopolitics. And then we'll come back and kind of try to button it up in comparison with every single region, how they have reacted to some of the challenges versus uh, what Indian Railways has done. And some of the revelations may be uh, very interesting for us to uh, look back. On. So um, with this, let's get started um, on North America. North American railroads are interesting in many ways. A, um, they started building the railroads in a very high scale centuries ago. It contributed to the industrial development of US as it emerged as a very large uh, industrial nation with a lot of production. Until the 1916, uh, it still used to be uh, very much dependent on the railways, very much unlike today. So 98% of all commercial intercity travelers would travel by trains, uh, as opposed to what we see today on, on the automobile and the airlines and avionics uh, reaching the advanced stage. 
Uh, what happened after the 1916 was that there were lots of smaller private uh, operators. So in the Woodrow Wilson regime, they wanted to create a uh, kind of a, a regulatory agency. So everybody starts following similar standards, if not identical to each other, but something that's manageable and, and, and something that could be governed by the federal government. Then came the World Wars. And uh, during the World War, it was a perfect opportunity to, to test some of the latest technologies at that time. So diesel uh, vehicles became popular. And uh, as we know, it's, it's a huge oil reserve in US and Canada put together. So the, the lean of, uh, of the whole exercise of how we can cut costs, et cetera, somehow pushed uh, the North American politics towards getting into uh, petroleum, automobile, and oil. And um, with the American ethos of, you know, make it or break it, run the businesses as a profitable uh, entity or break it and move on. A lot of railroad companies that were teeny tiny trying to function and operate as profit making companies crumbled and uh, it became an unsustainable uh, situation for most of the United States, but mainly over the Northeast, uh, there was a Con Rail, Consolidated Rail Corporation that was formed in 1976, not many years ago. Um, and then after running it for about 20 years, even Con Rail wanted to get itself acquired and they went to CSX. And we'll mm-hmm. dig into CSX in a little bit. And it started um, with a bit of um, conflicting situation with the Norfolk Southern Railways because Norfolk Southern thought that they have been cheated, they haven't been given enough opportunities to bid for the same uh, railroad assets. So eventually they split it 42-58. And um, at the same time, 1971 Amtrak was born with government support to continue to operate the passenger railroad. Otherwise it was going to uh, complete annihilation because of the hawkish policies set by the government uh, and lobbied by the auto and oil industries. And um, if we look a little bit farther into the American Railroad, um, there is this thing, um, <laughs> which uh, could be a taboo. And if you have uh, any, any uh, free time, you can research it out. Uh, it is said that allegedly um, General Motors and a few other automobile companies uh, bought over all the streetcars and um, basically junked them. The, the picture you see on the right-hand side, that's where the tram cars have been uh, stackpiled and replaced them with the double decker buses, uh, swanky looking, the Chicago Motor Coach Company. So uh, a lot of liberals call that as a, um, as a conspiracy. A lot of uh, fierce capitalists call them as the natural evolution of the organic progress of the American automobile industry. Uh, left for anybody's debate, but that's not what we are indulging in today. So. Uh, I would move on with uh, some of the things that we have seen in the recent past, right? Um, Things such as uh, America has invested in diesel technology and built world-class, world-class locomotives, engines, not just for railway uh, purposes, but also to run industrial power plants and so on. Um, That has evolved because they focused on their core competency. Um, But if I look under the hood of uh, American railroads today, if I stand uh, in a track side, this is what we will see. There are different classes of railroads, but uh, class one railroad is something that has revenue greater than 250 millions per year. And here are the seven, um, top seven. Uh, We know about BNSF, Union Pacific. I won't uh, shower you with data and numbers because it hardly matters for us. However, I would like to point out that the last two, the Canadian Pacific Railway and Kansas City Southern Railway merged as late as last year. So it's not big seven anymore, it's now big six. And uh, CPKC, Canadian Pacific Kansas City Southern is a new entity now. It's, these are all traded on, uh, on the stock market with the exception of BNSF Railway. Um, it's under Berkshire Hathaway and if you guys follow uh, Warren Buffett, the superstar investor, that's his company. So basically, this is how it runs. Um, freight railways, predominantly uh, diesel traction, 
hauled and owned. And uh, they're giant companies. Just look at the uh, revenues, billions of dollars floating there. Um, now, if we go to the next page, that's got the, the providers uh, of these railways. Um, you know, we talk about EMDs and GEs, but they eventually get acquired, uh, restructured, and so on. So what we have today is Progress Rail, which is basically the parent company of what used to be EMD, Electromotive Diesel. Um, that's, again, a Caterpillar company. So um, Progress Rail does have a lot of business within U.S., North America, as well as all over the world. In the same way, Wabtec, which took over the GE transportation, um, they also run a very competitive business. Again, these are very modern, world-class locomotives. And I think right now, Indian railways are probably running both of them. Uh, I do not know the share or proportion. I believe there are about 2,500 EMDs and uh, you know, shy of 1,000 GEs running over Indian railways. Uh, but anyone who knows the technology very well would attest to the fact that they are the best of their class. So um, that's about the American freight. Um, the HPs and submodels, again, I can provide details, but uh, for the purpose of this discussion, I will move on to um, the passenger railway system. The passenger railway system of North America is, is four tier. So tier one on the top is Amtrak and VRL, which is pretty much like the Indian railways, government owned, supported, but with a very limited uh, trackage rights. They usually uh, get leased slots on the privately owned uh, freight railways, uh, and then they operate their services, with a few exceptions where Northeast Corridor is Amtrak owned and VRL has its own tracks here and there, but in general that. And the second layer is the regional services. These are mainly state governments, city council, and uh, county run services. And um, if you had a lot of time, I could probably take you through all of them. Uh, NJ Transit is very popular. Uh, so is Long Island Railroad. EXO is for uh, Montreal and GEO is for Toronto, to name a few. They pretty much operate with the same structure. Um, it's a corporatized company funded by the, uh, the federal government and the state government and the city council. And they are, with their logos, they run distinct services. Sometimes they run on Amtrak uh, rails. Sometimes they run on um, their own rails. And, and if you go to Chicago, you'll find that local trains are running on BNSF tracks or Union Pacific tracks. That's also common. But they usually do not have their own tracks, with the exception of New Jersey Transit, which has got a good network of its own. The third layer is Brightline which is a new company founded in Florida. And it has a bit of history, which uh, we can probably touch upon. Um, Mr. Branson of Virgin, who owns the Virgin Airline, actually bid for that company, uh, bought it and named it Virgin Rail. Then the commercials did not work out, so it, he exited it. Now it's back to Brightline. They're extending a Miami to Orlando service that would run every half an hour. Let's see how that plays out. This is a very privately developed and owned system, and there are not many like that. And the fourth layer is the tourist train. Like our Palace on Wheels, uh, we have Rocky Mountaineers, Grand Canyon Railways. It's mostly geared towards uh, a luxury tourist kind of experience. Of course, they don't have their own rails for the most part, but Grand Canyon Railways does have its own trackage. So. It's a lot of variabilities. Uh, but if you look at it from the grand scheme of things, there are different models being played here. And it's not completely organized like the way a railway board would organize the operations in India. Okay. Um, so what kind of trains do we see today? Amtrak Star uh, service is Asila Express. This is a new technology um, that was brought in by uh, Alstom. Now, this is the second generation of Asila. Uh, uses uh, quite a bit of modern features. They are under trial now. Uh, the picture is real. And um, there are four train sets that are being tested on uh, Northeast Corridor. So something that we are looking forward to. Uh, there are a few more um, you know, Rolex stock-based observations that we would like to mention here. Um, so Bombardier got acquired by Alstom, as we know. 
uh, but they have the most market share. Like if you look at the NJ Transit examples here, there's a diesel on top, which runs with an EMD prime mover. And below there's a original Bombardier electric loco. So they look very similar and they operate all over New Jersey. Um, and if we go farther down, this is something to take interest in. So Bombardier launched a, uh, a new model called ALP45DP. Uh, it's a dual mode loco. So initially someone coined the term of diesel electric, then people said, oh, every diesel locomotive is diesel electric. So they called it electro diesel. And then some, some fancier consultant came and called it the last mile loco. But what happened was um, they piloted it in one of the Inotrans in Berlin. And uh, these locos were built in Germany. And it's very rare. They built in Germany, exported to North America. The one that you're looking at operates on, a, on the same platform as the previous one. So it's an electric loco that got augmented with um, diesel power packs. So they have two Caterpillar um, you know, generators. And depending on whether the section is wired versus not, it can on the fly switch between electric and diesel mode. So it became very popular. It's so popular that New Jersey Transit made a second order and uh, they basically dumped all the plants to you know, connect the missing links. And the beauty of that is there's no longer any electrification project going on. Wherever they want, they can push these locos. So uh, that's, that's a big development that happened in the last decade. Um, in addition to that, SES64 is a Siemens. So Siemens kind of uh, was always looking over the American market where Alstom and, uh, and, and Bombardier would rule. They entered late uh, in the last decade, between 2002 and 2007, they were assessing and they basically made a derivative of their European Sprinter model and threw that into North American Railroad. So if you go to Northeast Corridor today, you will see an ACS 64. Um, it's like a WAP 7 of Indian Railways. Wherever you go, there's one for you. Uh, could look boring, but this is the reality now. Um, on top of that, Siemens put up their games a little bit with uh, the diesel traction arena. So they brought in a charger version of the locomotives. That's their new platform. And uh, it became immensely popular because uh, it had the necessary you know, load haulage capacity. It was very low maintenance. So the traffic departments loved it of uh, all these uh, freight and Amtrak uh, railways. Every entity liked it. It, it went to the, to the fact that, um, you know, in the previous example, we saw an electric locomotive being augmented with diesel capacity. It happened the other way around here. So Amtrak asked Siemens to redesign the locomotive to build a dual mode based on the diesel loco platform. And what they came up with is this. It, it'll be the same Siemens charger, but it'll have a train set model where a locomotive is in one side and there's a remote driving cab. So what you're looking at is a Siemens Venture concept view of Amtrak. Um, I, I still don't know why Indian Railways does not do that, like putting a locomotive in one end and a remote cab at the other that also saves uh, in terms of you know local rotation and changing directions etc i think saptagiri express was the only one that was uh, experimented as part of southern railway um, but this is the new thing coming into america every single regional railway company amtrak vrl everybody ordered this train set so siemens is going to sell a whole bunch of chargers and these train sets going forward so in addition to that, a few higher level observations. Amtrak um, was not part of it, but California High Speed Railway was launched with a lot of democratic fanfare, but it's plagued with lots of political and funding related issues. No one knows when the project will be completed. Looks like delayed, number one. Number two is Amtrak Avelia Liberty. We talked a little bit about that, so I'll steer clear of it. Number three, Siemens Charger. We talked a little bit about that. This is the Charger Loco and then uh, six coaches to make it a train set. Number four is right now the only railroad that's undergoing electrification in the entire North America, that's Caltrain. 
and Stadler sold their Kiss. Stadler is the Swiss uh, manufacturer. Kiss double deck EMUs. They look quite sleek. They're still under testing. Hasn't been uh, commissioned yet. Uh, Stadler has this nice name, Kiss Flirt, uh, stuff like that. So quite funny. Um, then number five is Kawasaki M8. Uh, for those who have been to New York City, you know that these trains start from New York City uh, Grand Central Station with third rail power. Then before joining the Amtrak main line, they raise their pantographs and operate like any other overhead uh, power train. So quite unique. And number six is uh, regular double-decker trains for New Jersey. Again, Alstom was the prime bidder. Um, not that these trains did not exist, but they basically cut off the idea of having a locomotive in one end and said, let's make it self-propelled. So that's what is going on in the passenger railroad scenario in North America. Um, and then since we have been talking a lot about America, the summary is that the loading gauge is higher. Um, the passenger segment is mainly government owned and operated. Um, consolidations happened, CPKC uh, happened, then acquisitions happened with GE being uh, hived off to Optech. Um, the passenger railroad operations are now outsourced. Um, so if you go and look for NG Transit, you'll find that some company like Al Alstom may be providing the local pilots and operational support. Um, and at the end of the day, they have put a make in America policy that does not stop any global provider with credentials to sell in America, uh, but they have to build it in America. So if it's Kawasaki or uh, Nippon Shario or Bombardier, they don't care where these companies are based out of but you have to make it in America. So all these companies to take advantage of the American railroad market are now either establishing their manufacturing facilities or in process of finding land. So that's where we stand. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning is that USA also has FRA and FTA, two different regulatory companies. FRA looks after the mainline heavy freight and uh, passenger trains, and FTA is mainly the metro and subways. It's very similar to how we have now in India, as we have the RDSO and the Tramways Act kind of covering for both sides. So uh, I'll pause here if there are any observations um, that uh, we would like to resonate. Anamitra, what is the operating cost? Like, you know, uh, USA, uh, North America is a bean counter. So they will not do anything which is wasteful. So uh, diesel versus electric. I just wanted to put the gauntlet. I, I have been, so I don't have these numbers and it's almost dangerous to share anything. <laughs> what I can tell you is, yeah, what, what I can tell you is that the, the cost we pay in India for a unit of diesel or gasoline is a lot more expensive than uh, than what you pay in America. Yeah. So for USA, it does work out. For Canada, it does work out. Where okay. it does not, like Northeast Corridor or NJ Transit, they already electrified those. Okay. Um, I think we'll take the questions at the end. So please yeah, continue. Yeah, let's, yeah. yeah let's, let's continue. Then um, the next section is for Europe. Again, a bit of brief history. Uh, Think about railroad being actually invented and practiced and championed in Europe in 1800s. Then the World War happened. And when the World War happened, um, suddenly, you know, the, the eastern side and the western side of the two uh, worlds collided and then separated for many, many years. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, Germany and France, all the richer countries were spending lots of money investing in their own companies, which some of which you may have heard of already. Um, and they were developing very fast. Then something happened in 1989. Uh, you know, the Mikhail Gorbachev, Perestreika, Glasnost Terra, Berlin Wall collapsed. And suddenly the, the East and West Germany met. And uh, in 1995, Schengen Agreement basically lifted all the borders between these countries. So the opportunities, and this is the first time uh, in many years, East Europe got to see how developed the West Europe has become because they were not even allowed in. And uh, West Europe with their latest technologies found a huge market looking East. 
Um, and looking east means go to Poland, go to Ukraine, Belarus, all the way up to China. They found their markets. And in Central Asia, they're already selling. So in 81 and 91, France and Germany consecutively started their own high-speed rails. But in 2009, they were selling high-speed rail in Russia, in Turkey, in, Kazakh, in Uzbekistan. So that's the result of you know, the unification and the, the collapse of the Soviet era. So uh, if we just put it in a, in a similar context as, um, as what we saw for America, here we are talking about Deutsche Bahn, the German railways, SNCF, the French railways, is the national railways, and the Russians. They are making the most of, of the money because of they, they had a lot of uh, existing assets. Their experience is rich, and during wartime, they were the most active. And all the names that you see at the bottom, I don't want to go to each of them. Uh, they are also the subsidiaries or third parties that are helping with the logistics. Um, if we go to the next page, um, so, so if we go to Europe on a, on a week-long tour, this is what we see. A whole bunch of high-speed trains, fancy looking, nice nose and beak. Uh, mostly they're manufactured by Alstom, which is French, Talgo, which is uh, Spanish, or Stadler. Stadler joined the party much later. That's a Swiss company. And of course, the Siemens Velaro, the ICE brand, that is all over the world right now. Um, in fact, China started with the, the ICE and they learned the high-speed technology from Germany. And um, if you look at the locomotives as what, what kind of things they run, um, we see that Alstom and Siemens, these are the big parties, uh, they have pretty much taken over the, the world, if not the entire Europe. So what Alstom did was to take over Bombardier, the track series number one. Uh, you know, the track series is the same thing that we saw for NG Transit and the dual mode local. It's the same platform. So it's a platform economy they're playing, invent it once and just modify to fit the need. The, the second one is Alstom Prima. Uh, if we remember the WAG 12 deal that Indian Railways had, this is basically two of these Alstom Primas uh, with different capacities. So we kind of Indianized, localized, and uh, kicked off similar project. In the right-hand side for Siemens, the Siemens Eurosprinter is, is also a very popular local, but you saw a derivative of that in ACS 64 in America. That's the Web 7 of America. And number four is the Vectron. Now, Vectron is coming to India with a 9,000 horsepower Coco locomotive to be manufactured out of Dahod facilities. So they may not look exactly like this for the purpose of saving money in aesthetics, but it will be basically the same class of locomotives. Um, the other two that need worth mentioning are Newag, that's a Poland-based manufacturer. They make their own locomotives for East Europe. And Skoda, the same Skoda that makes uh, Octavia. Uh, they also have a very uh, robust platform and they continue to sell in Balkans. So Czech railways have that uh, under their belt. Uh, with that, it's, it's always good to have a look at what's going on in the East. So Russian Gage, these guys are all uh, back in, you know, Alstom, Siemens, uh, all the way up to Czech. We are looking at standard gauge, but Eastern Europe is still on Russian gauge. Anything in the east of Poland, uh, they're stuck with it. Uh, of course, the Russian equipment is still being um, used. There's Ural locomotive, uh, NCE and Kolomna locomotive works. Some of these locomotives are very unique, uh, not because of their box shape, but uh, maybe I can, uh, I can try to zoom it in a little bit to show you something. Uh, look, at the, look at the truck, the bogies of this loco. It's bo, 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 bo. You won't find this elsewhere. That's why um, every time I visited East Europe, I paid special attention to, to these unique locomotives. They're very interesting, and they do their job very well. And if you take Trans-Siberian Railway, you will also be traveling behind one of these and maybe some of the modern ones, because these are kind of outdated, most of them. Um, so we are now stuck in Europe with the Western Europe in standard gauge, Eastern Europe in Russian gauge, operating this, this group of locomotives and, and rolling stock. Okay. 
Um, and in the same kind of view, so we can kind of provide an Apple with Apple picture, uh, there's America and there's Europe. So number one is the high-speed railway of UK. HS2 is again delayed. The government is most likely scrapping or delaying the project indefinitely. So very similar situation as the California high-speed rail. Uh, number two is Evolin. It's, it's a fun experiment they're doing there. Eurostar used to take the, the channel uh, tunnel between France and Lille in France and UK. They're putting a second private company, which will compete with Eurostar on the same rails. So, and it's a conscious effort to garner competition in the European railroads like that. So Evolin is coming. Alstom will provide the train sets just like Alstom provided to Eurostar. So we'll see how that plays out. Probably some price war and some good deals. The third one is uh, open access rail. So what Europe has said is that, look, we have a great railway infrastructure. Why don't we uh, give some uh, opportunities to the startups or smaller companies or the companies who want to explore passenger railroad? And then a flurry of new initiatives started. Now we see that Arriva and Netherlands and Sparwagen, which is the NS rail of Netherlands, are going in. But if you know companies like Flix Train, they basically raised money through crowdfunding and then started trains which are cheaper and probably traveling slightly slower than the high-speed trains, but they're immensely popular. So that's a new open access is a new trend that they're exploring. Um, worth mentioning mm -hmm. that the Italian high-speed train, that's number four, the Freccia Rosa, Freccia Argento, they are pretty much Japanese sourced. Uh, Hitachi has got new orders again. It's not very common to see in Europe that uh, the Asian uh, train manufacturers have been given access. Number five, China was a no-no. China was absolutely untouchable, but recently China made inroads into East Europe in countries like uh, Macedonia and Serbia and Bosnia. They're trying to uh, up their games. So we will probably see more CRRC stock entering Europe. Number six is night jet trends. Uh, for those who want to spend the night uh, instead of putting money in a hotel and travel to a different place, uh, this concept was abandoned uh, 10 years ago. Now Austrian Railways has brought it back. So these are old sleeper coaches that would travel from, let's say, Amsterdam to Zurich. Um, and you have a pretty good journey at a very reasonable cost. So these things are being brought back to rejuvenate tourism in Europe. Um, so we talked a little bit about the gauges and the problem Europe is facing. And to uh, apprehend that the Spanish, so, so the Spanish are now stuck with the Iberian gauge, Iberian gauge that's in the peninsula of Spain and Portugal, which is uh, slightly wider. Uh, it's like 16, 68 millimeter, pretty close to our broad gauge of India. Uh, and they created this, this new technology where the train on the fly changes gauge like the the wheels uh, kind of contract or expand to fit the new gauge and move on so there's no need to stop crunch ship etc and they started if you look at the um, uh, the picture number two that's a high speed train it's a renfe high speed train that has the gate changing capacity it comes in changes gauge and moves on that's how they experimented it and it's running right now Another uh, good outcome of this exercise was uh, a Berlin to Moscow direct intercity train. So Berlin is in Germany and standard gauge and Moscow is in Russian gauge. So this train, it's not exactly a train set, but its wheels are equipped with the gate changing and they have at the border station, the gate changing equipment. Um, so on both sides, the locomotives are provided with the standard features uh, They just... Uh, interoperate between the two gauges. It's expensive. And I do not know in the Ukraine conflict where this service is. I tend to believe that it's been suspended for, uh, for the time being. But with this political problems aside, this has been successfully tested at the border of Belarus and Poland. Um, now Stadler, the Swiss uh, competitor came up with a dual mode loco as well. Uh, it's, again, a diesel loco converted to dual mode. So they put electric equipment to operate 
and they call it a last mile loco. Basically, they they want to go to the sidings and industrial uh, the mining uh, functions by just uh, switching away from the main line. Um, so the diesel HP the, the it is lower than the electric. Somehow it works out still. It's better than keeping shunting locomotives for uh, for diesel. So these are the innovations that have taken place recently that are noteworthy. Um, the, I did not mention the BEMU, the, the battery electric multiple unit, because it's still in the process of testing. Alstom also tested hydrogen trains. That would be for another day. Um, so Europe is different. The, the electrics are the clear choice for freight. Open access is being used. Um, Passenger segment is again government funded predominantly with some high speed railway companies operating on their own like corporate companies. Consolidations did happen. Eurostar took over the SIC Thales high speed railway company. Now they operate up to Amsterdam. Uh, major consolidations, these names may resonate a little bit. Amstom, Amst, sorry, Alstom took over ABB, which gave us the Web 5 and Web 9 uh, many years ago. And later, Bombardier sold, hived off their businesses, uh, like the power engineering, uh, several others, uh, to GE, Man Group, and Arriva. So they consolidated their business on electric traction, and they took away a lot of areas where they were not as competitive as they thought. Um, they're, they're mostly running on Siemens and Alstom, as we talked about, and Stadler, but they're also very comfortable with Kawasaki and Nippon Shario. So uh, it's kind of a push and pull, uh, but Japanese have successfully broken into the European market, it looks like. Uh, they already embraced the fact that Iberian gauge and Russian gauge would be there. They're not trying to do a mass uni-gauge project uh, because A, it's under several administrations and B, they did not see the viability into it. So that's all about Europe. And uh, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, jump on to the next pages. Uh, China, so how did China reform its railways? So we talk a lot of, about the, the number two CRRC, which was basically like our ICF, RCF, CLW, BLW, et cetera. They consolidated them and then created a publicly traded company, state-owned, publicly traded, and uh, they learned the technology from the imported stock, and then they went to the world to sell them. We do not talk as much about number one, the construction corporation. So CRCC has created a framework through which they make rapid uh, development. So if you saw pictures of how high-speed railways being developed in China, like they put uh, viaducts and they carry the spans and the girders and you know they put it next to each other, completely automated, stuff like that they learned and they improvised on and they took to the world. So a very, very effective uh, tool to have. And then number three is uh, the largest high-speed rail network, as we know. It's a combination of having the rolling stock, the signal and telecom equipment, and the construction capability. So looking very good for China, only if they can break into newer geographies. Japan is is uh, slightly a little older as, as a developed nation. As a result, the cost of development is much, much higher in Japan. It's extremely difficult to get anything for cheap. Uh, Japanese banks provide soft loans, but the equipment are not cheap. So uh, they successfully privatized. Um, they split the old Japanese railroad into several companies, some private, some government owned, seem to operate in a, in a very concerted effort and make profits too. Um, but what the Japanese did in the meantime is to create some world-class uh, companies that would do manufacturing, commissioning, and even outsourcing of the operations. So I have the picture here under number three, the WAM2 locomotive that had the builder's plate. When I was a kid in the 80s and 90s, uh, I would see Hitachi, Mitsubishi, Toshiba written on the builder's plate. So they came straight from Japan. And these companies are still uh, out there and they're selling all over the world. So covering China and Japan, um, it, it basically tells a story of how competitive each of these uh, segments have become and each geography has its own money to spend. Um, then 
it's never complete without talking a bit about what China has been doing over the last few years. Number one, um, Malaysia and Singapore. Um, if you take the southern route of Malaysia's capital Kuala Lumpur to Seremban to Johor Bahru to the woodlands uh, border, they plan to build a high-speed rail with the help of China. But the West came and basically said, you cannot. Um, so they could not move forward. Uh, they, they're in a uh, predicament, but there's not much they can do. That's number one. Number two is Mexico. Mexico, as you may know, that uh, was a good friend of China. China was trying to pull them into BRICS um, group of emerging nations. Um, but then when they started with a Chinese high-speed rail project, half away, the West came and uh, admonished Mexico. So they had to cancel the project under the Western pressure. So as a result, they had to reimburse uh, about 100,000 pounds, as you can see. These are all available on internet. So CRRC demanded that for the abandoned project, they should be compensated, and which was gracefully accepted by Mexico at that time. And if you read the column number three, um, it, it's, it's all about how the West sees China's interest in going to the world. And Sub-Saharan Africa is, is probably their focus right now, which we will look at in the next page. Um, these are all snippets from newspapers. So just name it. East Africa, Ethiopia, Djibouti, Algeria, Morocco, Uganda, Sudan, Kenya. And the, the policy that the Chinese um, have is right now to go to a country, provide soft loans, and then um, you know, send the armed forces to guard it and the operational staff and then start influencing the local markets, develop the supply chain, etc. So one example here is about Kenya. So as you know, five years ago, the interest rates were plummeting because there was quantitative easing going on by the central banks. During COVID, the interest rates uh, kind of spiked. Now it's uh, probably 600 basis points above. So Kenyan railways no longer can pay even the interest of, of the loan they have taken. So they have increased the passenger fare to kind of try to manage the debt a little bit. So um, I think Ethiopia is happier. Uh, Uganda is somewhere in the middle who said, this is not going to work for us. Kenya is already uh, in, a, in a very bad spot. So the outcome could be very different depending on how the risk analysis has been done while bringing in an external party. And then um, about 10 years ago, China launched uh, for their own uh, de-risking of the sea route, uh, a direct threat service from, uh, from the mainland China to Western Europe. The problem with that was uh, there are two gate change points, right? Uh, between China and Kazakhstan, you have to ship them from standard gauge to Russian gauge. And in the Belarus-Poland border, you have to ship it back from uh, Russian gauge to standard gauge. Somehow, they built a consortium with the Germans, with the Kazakhstan government and, and the Russians. So everybody is a partner in this uh, now, and it's been flowing pretty well. There was a grinding halt when the Ukrainian conflict started, but uh, from what has been reported, China has found a southern route, which is to go through Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, cross the Caspian Sea through the sea route, and then still enter uh, Germany, Duisburg, UK, and eventually Spain. So the picture you see below, the green loco, it's actually a train going to Madrid straight from China. China tried to bypass Russia because um, it's expensive to do tr two different transshipments between standard gauge and Russian gauge has not been very successful, but um, they are, they're kind of bouncing back from the Ukrainian conflict because the, you know, in the right bottom, you see that the China Europe rail freight traffic again uh, came back, uh, increased by 27% in 2023. So this is the preferred choice of Europeans as well as the Chinese, even though it passes through Russia. And it's going pretty well because it's faster than the maritime route. And uh, it also does not have the, uh, the, the challenges of, you know, having a NATO presence in South China Sea, Indian Ocean, and the, the Canal of Switch. So this is where the Chinese are making strides again. So 
this is what we had about you know taking a retrospective look on what has been happening and also to look at what's going to happen um, in the three key regions and then i just kind of thought of pivoting it back to what it means for indian railways is there anything we can learn from it is there anything we can leverage from the learnings and mistakes that the others have done so um i have three pages but i'll go at uh, bullet train speed to cover it the coaching and passenger railroad i mean people have corporatized corporatized which means they started companies with a logo branding but mostly the passenger railroad is still under government control and support anywhere in the world they tried to fully privatize it did not go really well i can name the example of uk it it went horribly and they're still not able to get their things together so india probably has not started as much of privatization but uh, there's a there's definitely a willingness if there's a time when uh, when there are private parties that can be encouraged to join uh, we can think about those um then comes the freight railroad um in, in the freight railroad americans like to do bulk carriage so lots of goods they went after those smaller goods probably would go on the the roadways um and uh, europeans have smaller trains and they have sectional issues they have smaller loop lines um they don't have the the loading gauge that the americans have because europe is predominantly electrified and chinese and japanese pretty much follow the same european process chinese are trying to get out of the constraints indians have been pretty smart so um it's still operated as uh, you know combined passenger come freight but what's plaguing is that the capacity challenges like there's so many passenger trains that need to get the the first uh, preference and then there's also a punitive charge and fee in the event it gets delayed so operationally it's not that easy and in multimodal traffic um americans tend to send a lot of double stack container trains which are probably 200 wagons long 5 6 7 locomotives hauled uh europe sends smaller trains maybe 20 wagons long um india learned from both uh and put together the wdfc project it's electrified as well as double stack container um option uh, exercise i do not know of any other nation that has done that chinese run double stack containers but those are like dwarf containers and i can't recall the exact size it's not as uh, effective as what india can do with the uh, the wdfc of course the eastern dfc does not have that uh, ability um so there are suddenly lessons that india has learned uh, just to keep these uh, side by side the choice of gauge north america always had standard gauge didn't bother to to uni gauge europe will live with what they have chinese have predominantly standard gauge japanese have two gauges they'll live with that india went berserk with a uni gauge project and um, questionably or arguably succeeded in it um and in the long run it's going to pay off uh choice of fuel north america diesel everybody else decided to go electric for partially electrified routes there's north american choice of dual mode loco europe is getting into that um chinese and japanese would change the loco india will go 100% electrification prior to that it will be diesel under wire um multiple system in electric traction again most european locomotives have multiple you know voltages and frequencies accepted um in the same way north america and and japan also functions china and india have very similar approach they chose a uniform power supply and converted everything to fit to that model so that's going to last the taste of time regional services is where everywhere people are decentralizing making the local state uh, city councils responsible for the cost india still tends to run everything under the central command with the near term exception of mutp or mrvc that was uh, of course funded by the world bank but uh, the maharashtra government had a stake in it i do not know of many other state governments to to pay for the suburban railways development um japanese are very open so they have private public mix 
and Chinese do not have a great regional <clears throat> transportation plan. So it's just Beijing, and that's under a company owned by the Chinese government. Um, next one is exim traffic, export import. So North America has two types of trains. Uh, one is export import train, the other is a regular domestic train, and they run it's hard to tell which one is which by looking at them, but they run things with a very good set of priorities that's connected with the shipping companies at the harbor and so on. So it works for them. Europe does not have border control in the Schengen zone. Only when they go to the east, they have to do gate change, local change and everything. It's not easy. Same problem with the Chinese. Whichever direction they head, they get into Russia, Mongolia, it's Russian gauge. Central Asia, Russian gauge. India, they don't have a connection. Vietnam, meter gauge. So China has a border restrictions uh, for natural reasons. Japanese do not care. They don't have any land border with another country. Uh, India has quite a bit of wagon exchanges with Bangladesh, but generally the same wagons move on. Uh, on broad gauge, the loco is changed. Generally, there are exceptions though. Um, the last one, is a supplier base. So this is very political, but somehow North America figured a way to invite the manufacturers to come to North America and build bases and supply. Europe is still not that open. Um, if, if anyone wants to go to Europe and start selling, the tenders have stringent clause and experience and several terms, but the Japanese have broken into it. Chinese are trying, knocking at the door. The Chinese would import, um, like they started with the high-speed rail, there was Siemens, there was Alstom, there was Shinkansen coming from Japan. They reverse engineered and localized and they built their own high-speed train. So now they're very self-sustained and uh, self-supplied. CRRC is taking care of it. Japanese always were advanced, they'll continue to be, and they have their own things going. India is experimenting. So um, it was pretty much the same process. Uh, bringing, inviting on global tenders, bringing new technologies, then localizing, and then for the next 25 years, building equipment in a very high scale. Um, so the cost comes down and then move on to the next one. Recently, uh, with the GE and Alstom deals, we see that uh, we are inviting people to, to build bases, develop the locomotives, design and develop, as well as take care of the maintenance for foreseeable future. That gives a lot more confidence to the operator and manufacturer to actually make mistakes and learn from it. Um, we certainly cannot go away without talking uh, to the Vande Bharat topic. Uh, it's a, probably the first time in such a short notice, in a sh short time frame, such a train set was uh, developed with active participation of uh, subject matter experts and contractors, sorry, consultants. Um, and then we could actually pull it off with high-scale manufacturing. So now there are more sets than the routes to ply from what I hear. So overall, in a, in a very broad view, India probably learned a lot from many other economies which have been advancing at the same time. And how the future is going to unfold is for all of us to look at. But if there's any, anything that we could do any differently, this may be the time to discuss. So with this, I'll stop my blabbery, Singh sir. Um, we probably don't have any time to take questions, uh, but regardless, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you I very, very much. Time. I think you've given us a bird's eye view of the entire railways all over the world. Yeah. As you mentioned yourself, probably the only area which is missing is Australia. Otherwise you've covered, and perhaps South Africa, Otherwise, I think you covered the entire world. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, if there are any questions or uh, any comments. Uh, it's like the Jules Byrne to... story. Around the world in 60 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, um, when I committed to this topic, and in a hindsight, I figured that it's a lot. It's mm -hmm. a lot. I shouldn't have probably picked up this. I could have done a deep dive on one of the sections. But... We can probably do it in the coming year. So if we do not get a chance to talk to everyone before that, have a very happy holidays and very happy new year ahead of you. Uh, Anamitra, one question is, how are these things funded? Are they actually bought equipment or are they leased? Like, you know, aircrafts are not bought, they're leased. So um, such, uh, how, how are these, how's the funding taking place? 
it's a so leasing is very common in europe Okay. Um, so there are smaller logistics companies that would just lease from the actual equipment manufacturer as well as some leasing companies who buy locomotives and lease, mm -hmm. something like what happens in the aircraft industry. It's not that common in, for instance, Asia or America, um, but it's becoming a trend for some of the very focused uh, organizations that run, for instance, Flix company I was taking the name of, yeah. that's a crowdsourced organization. They don't have any equipment of their own. Okay. They pulled some funds and leased locomotives, coaches, and started a train. Yeah. Uh, Apurvaji, just to add on that, uh, yeah. Namitraji covered uh, the class one railroads, but uh, in the US, you also have a lot of short lines. Yes. So some of these short lines, they do lease the uh, uh, equipment directly from the uh, locomotive manufacturers, at least to the extent that uh, uh, I was reading about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Anamitra, one more thing which you have uh, not covered is the railways of uh, the uh, Sweden, uh, uh, Norway, Denmark. They're unique in the sense that uh, do they use uh, Siemens equipment or do they use their own? Because those locomotives are also pretty unique. Maybe the previous generation yeah. was. Uh, yeah, I think that could go for a, a follow up, follow on session yes. because there are very, very important similarities. If you look into Finland, they still follow Russian standards. If you go to Sweden, they have the West European standards. So, <clears throat> depending on which specific topic we would like to uh, double click on, yeah. we may find interesting details. Yeah, it's it's important yeah. to also focus Atul, on Scandinavia. Uh, yeah, Atul, yes, sir, you wanted to speak. Yes. Uh, oh, good afternoon. I was just curious to know who's doing the maintenance of these locomotives. Are they done through AMCs or is it done by the uh, the, the operating companies or other third parties? So the leased ones um, that's maintained by the company that's leasing the the locomotives. But other than that, if you take uh, the example of Amtrak of US, they have their own maintenance facilities, just like we have our local sheds and locomotives have to pay a visit in a, in a typical regimented cycle. And then they also have their overhauling schedule, et cetera. So once Amtrak owns it, Amtrak owns it. Okay. Um, it's probably going to get more into a build, lease, transfer model going forward. Uh, but that's something people are watching. In fact, a lot of railroad enthusiasts are watching India to see how this mm -hmm. uh, Amtrak and G deal evolves. If it's a success, then it's a high scale a success story to share with the rest of the world. Harish, sir, you wanted to speak? Harish Joshi? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of suggest to JL, sir, that Africa is developing in a very big way. And... Uh, uh, since I work for a company, we have been to uh, their exhibitions. Like I, I went to uh, Johannesburg last uh, rail rail expo exhibition, and we have been supplying some components to Tanzania. I find there is a lot of negative uh, vibes about Chinese in African market, and if something more informative discussion and dialogue could be heard. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities for Indian companies to delve into the African market because they have a potential to develop and they are floundering. Exactly. Uh, uh, they yeah. need a lot of uh, skills upgrade. They need a lot of, uh, you know, uh, small investments can give very big returns in that country. But we are yeah. not able to catch them. I mean, whatever government is doing, I don't know what they are doing. But private industry can play a very big role because, you know, companies like Rights, what happens, they don't look at any contract less than 10, 20 million dollars. As a private company, we would look at any contract worth 3, 4 million dollars also worth it and go in. But we do not have, of course, it has to be through an agent and all that. But we do not have an insight into the economics of the whole thing that the funding, etc., so if some somebody can delve into this America, this African continent uh, uh, conundrum, this will perhaps be a good platform to you know uh, give a uh, thought and share with everyone, and we can then ask uh, some companies to come forward and our my own company can also come forward and. 
So yeah, just to just to add to that, it's not just Africa; it's also Latin America where the Latin Chinese America are thriving. Also, because there is right? one country where we have same Indian standard, actually. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yes. Argentina. So we have yeah, yeah. Argentina, Argentina also is dominated by China. Indian yeah. gauge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't go um, there at all. We don't even go there. Go there, yeah. Harish, about twenty years back, rights had sent me to Brazil and Argentina to see if there was a market there for rights because they have a gauge very similar to our broad gauge. Yep. If I remember right, it is 1600 mm. Now, the agent whom we had appointed in Brazil said, said told me this. He says Brazil has a population of 150 million, of which about 30 million are the people who control the country. They are people of European descent. They will not look at India. So don't waste your time. This is what we were told. Yeah, so my experience is that, and I continue to travel and talk to financial companies, uh, it's it's operated in a way that your Exim Bank goes with a stapled <laughs> loan, and that makes them um, much more amenable to an idea that India is not only supplying, they're also funding these investments. We have done that with Bangladesh a couple of times. Yeah, most, of the, for Bangladesh, most of the exports I mean, to neighboring countries have been through funding by India. Yes. Yeah, that's the problem. Exim yeah. Bank only comes in the picture when they see the government backing for the project, they right. don't come to a private sector player and say that we guarantee your investments. They don't do that. Yeah, that's where the policy uh, clutter is, I think. There's a lot to discuss there. Yeah, Anamitra, in a very small way, we are also doing it with Nepal. So uh, there, yep, uh, you're right. Yeah, so it's it's in Nepal, India, and Bangladesh. It's one, yep. one, one block. And, yep. Uh, so uh, we are not giving only, not only our neighbors, even Africa. We've been yeah. doing a lot of line of credit to African countries. Yes. I spent four years in Mali, not on the railway field, but other than railways. And the method, almost all the projects that were being done by Indian companies were through lines of credit given by India. Yeah, yep. that's right. So there is a, but you know, what happens is those projects are 100 billion, 50 million dollars where rights, Irkon and these people participate. But there are Countries where even a 10 million investment will improve their infrastructure, will improve their wagons, will improve that. And there is no no takers for those kind of projects because rights is, is too small for them. Correct. Yes. So they are just getting neglected. And Chinese come, they say, Ki isko junk this, we'll give you new wagons. So that is also not happening because they don't have the money. Is there so, any country in the French world girl. which actually uh, is there any country in the world which actually enjoys a good uh, uh, wives with China. I mean, I know Africa everywhere. Uh, Chinese are the spies. Uh, and India has an opportunity to take that forward because India is yeah. yeah. so that is possible. Yeah. I think as far as Argentina goes, uh, uh, from what I could understand from talking to some of the Argentinians, they do have a very positive opinion of India. And then uh, some of their long distance trains, which they recently started using, China, they are not so happy with it. So I think it's it's we still at least if not in Brazil I think we still have a lot of opportunity to explore in uh, Argentina is what I'm thinking. Yep. Yeah, I heard that there is an interest of uh, Vande Bharat trains yeah. for uh, these countries. I only heard uh, you know some whispers, but I don't know the facts. There are some interest shown by these countries for Vande Bharat. What I read in newspapers, I don't know the facts. In fact, all yeah. the countries India is normally exported to are not electric trains at all. So I don't think we can export Vande Bharat, not in the foreseeable future to the countries we are already exporting to. Converting to a diesel platform? We have Perhaps. But this the, the, present, the present Vande Mozambi. Bharat we cannot export. We have, we have supplied diesel DMU, DEMUs to Mozambique on a on, on LHB platform. Uh, it should be possible to do it. I mean, this re-engineering is now in the in the possibility in the I mean in the Indian context. It's not something which is not doable, provided you can put things together and there are there is a nucleus of people who uh, want to get into you know making uh, India a uh, power source. I don't know how that can be done. So Mozambique, yeah, also Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lankan railways are running on the S. Sri Lankan railways to India yeah. supplies a lot, but also yeah. governmented. They don't yeah. buy okay. their it's, own it's just a line of credit. Ah, correct. Okay. Are... Mozambique pays it. Mozambique has money, is it? Yeah, Mozambique has money okay. because they purchased recently uh, 
uh, I think 10 locomotives and 300 uh, wagons. Unfortunately, what I hear now, rights was L1 in both the tenders. And they force rights to say that they are, do not want to buy wagons from, from rights, despite being L1. And they gave the order to Chinese. Because they had no agent in the Mozambique territory to sort of pilot their case. Okay. That is a tragedy. Yeah. So, they yes, that, they, they have lost that contract. From... And I don't know whether they will get the diesel contract or not. See, yeah, Rights that's... has done a lot of work in Africa. I can ask someone from Rights to give a talk on yeah. uh, the African railways. That will be excellent. Yes, sir. Yes. That will be great. I mean, that's what we want. I am looking for that. that if somebody... no, I'll get somebody from Rights to do it. Right. I mean, I can also, also give the talk, but mine would be 20 years, uh, 20 years out of date. So, yeah, one more topic that's probably of everybody's interest is how railways are looking at non-transportation revenues, because recently a lot of discussions have happened on how to leverage real estate, advertising, da da da, da. So Japan Railways made lots of uh, progress in that. Europe has done a lot of that. So how to... How to uh, generate more cash by leveraging the existing resources. That could be one. The only, so I wanted to chime in on this. The reason the Chinese are so strong and so aggressive is that they run like a profit-making corporation. It's a traded company in the stock exchange. When you compare that with a um, state-owned, you know, capacity-oriented um, production houses, the, the, basic you know difference or approach or go to market would be very 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 different and i'm not suggesting that we go this way or the other it's a very debated topic but basically on top of crrc there are the shareholders and the board members yelling at them every day and asking for status so besides they're going with their army so a lot of things that the chinese government can do is um you know, arguably not easy to do for a democratic country. Sure. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Sir. Anyway, um, it, I did not mean to turn this into a political debate, but thanks a lot for your inputs. I think we certainly have a long chain of uh, related topics that we can cover in the new year. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, Mitra, I'll, I'll invite you again after a couple of months on a more specific topic rather than, you know, one that covers the entire world. I'm sure you will be good at that. Um, again, I'm, I'm very overrated at this moment, but uh, I'll try. We'll be looking forward to it. And then may I volunteer, sir? I can take any one of these regions and then maybe cover an in-depth right. uh, material. Yeah. Are, you, are, you, are you okay for next month? Next month? <laughs> I, haven't got a, I haven't got a speaker for January yet. Anyway, I'll talk to you separately about that. Yeah, this is okay. Anyway, I would like to thank Anumitra Ghatak for an extremely good talk. I think uh, in a very short period, he has covered the railways all over the world, which is not easy at all. Hmm? And uh, as I said, uh, I will try and get someone from rights to talk about the African railways. This is one part of the world we normally don't talk too much about. But... Uh, uh, I mean, we can have that can be one of our one topic for one of our future uh, future talks. Yes, and we have, I would like on behalf of all of us thank Anomitra for an excellent talk. At least I've learned a lot. I'm sure everybody has. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you much. And appreciate your time. Joining. Bye. Thank uh, you for very joining. Very nice to see yeah. you all. Yeah. Yeah. Jail sir, please share the recording link. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Then we'll close for the day. Yes, sir.